welcome to Level with Emily Reese. This is music by Michael Bross for the VR game Edge of Nowhere. The game came out last year, but Michael just put out the soundtrack in the last few days. He used a couple different groups. He had a tiny group of string players and an orchestra in separate recording sessions, plus some other interesting sounds that he'll tell you about for sure. Michael's worked on literally hundreds of games, whether as a composer, audio director, sound designer, all kinds of things. Uh, some of those include four Ratchet and Clank titles. He worked on the Oddworld series, and he's composed one of the music packs for Counter-Strike Global Offensive. You might know that in that game, Valve, who develops it, lets players swap out music from this whole selection of tracks written by different composers, such as Michael. So we talk about all of those properties, which was great fun. Quick warning though, sometimes when I first call someone for an interview, we chat for a few minutes, then I try to make it clear when the interview is actually starting, you know, like, okay, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready, let's do it. But with Michael, our chatting turned into the interview, so for the first handful of seconds, I'm asking him a question and I'm off the mic, but only for a few words. You'll hear me like pull a blanket over my head and stick my face in a box, because that's how we roll around here. Enjoy. I was snooping around, you know, about you trying to find other interviews and things like that, and um, that's when I stumbled across the that article you wrote about um, creating the music and that, you know, the whole reason that you ended up writing that article was because of that panel. And so I found that really cool. Yeah. Um, Well, I actually did, there was the panel and then I did a separate talk. Right. About um, that game, right? Yeah. 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 So that, that was the gun for the same general event. And yeah, so I gave a talk on that and I had all these notes and I had been meaning to put them together and, form that people could actually read and I finally just got around to it and part of the reason why I did it was because it coincides with the release of the soundtrack. you wrote for the game into a soundtrack it's it's not like you can just snap your fingers and put fades at the end and stuff i mean you have to yeah. construct things right yeah exactly the game had it had about two and a half hours of music which is a fair amount and and so i kind of boiled it down to you know what i thought would work i actually wish i had added more to the album itself but when i was putting it together there were a lot of things going on and i didn't have a lot of time to pull it together uh, i just put something together that worked but if the game would have been more popular i, I would do a volume two release <laughs> oh wow because you wrote quite a bit of music like two and a half hours you said yes i wrote mm-hmm. that was the finished music i did have some music that i wrote that was you know conceptual stuff and and some other things that actually never did end up making it into the final build of the game gotcha you know this happens sometimes where we say hello and then suddenly we're like in the middle of what <laughs> i could use as an interview and and yeah. i just want to make sure that you're recording because some of that is very keepable <laughs> yes so i'm i actually started recording as soon as i started the call so wonderful did write a really great article on how the whole process, and there were so many parts of it that kind of fascinated me, but if you could just start off by just describing what the game is like as a player, like what what happens in the game. 
Oh, sure. So the game itself is an action adventure. Just to actually back up a little bit, it was developed by Insomniac Games, and uh, it was published on the Oculus Rift, and it came out with the actual actually came out around the launch of the Rift itself. So, but the game itself, I think it's probably about a uh, maybe six hours of gameplay, six to eight hours of gameplay, and it's an action-adventure style game. It's set in early 20th century Antarctica, and you're kind of driving a character by the name of Victor who goes to Antarctica, and I don't want to give too much away in the story, but sure. basically he's going to find the love of his life who's lost, and and then kind of the story unfolds from there. And of course, it being in Antarctica, it's a difficult place to survive, sure. you know, especially for that time period, early 20th century. So so there's that. And then from a gameplay perspective, you're basically driving the character in third-person perspective. And yeah. there are definitely some creepy aspects to, to what happens in this game. I mean, the, the, the music itself is frightening often, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. tell me a little bit about that aspect of it. Sure. So, you know, we typically think of horror music as it can be pretty dissonant at times. And mm-hmm. and not to say that this stuff isn't dissonant, but I'm always thinking about, you know, if it is dissonant, how can I still keep it so it's beautiful? And so that's always my approach when I'm, I'm working on, definitely when I'm working on music in general, and then definitely for, for this soundtrack itself, the score. I noticed a lot of those really beautiful moments just really come out because of the, I think, scary aspects of it. But there's some really beautiful string writing, which I know you got to work with a full orchestra. So tell me no, a little you. bit about, yeah, working, working with them. Oh, sure. So I did two separate sessions and two very different sessions. The final session, I'll talk about that first. Um, that was the with the big group with a 50, I think it was 52 or 55 piece orchestra. That was recorded in Nashville and we recorded at Ocean Way. I've recorded there in the past on the Ratchet and Clank project on that series. So I was familiar with the, the group and the people there and, and they've always been awesome to work with. And so I had the opportunity to go there and record this score, which was really great. And so that was the second session. The first session was pretty interesting. I recorded closer to you know where I live here in the Bay Area. We recorded in Berkeley uh, at Fantasy Studios. And so that session was, it was actually a very small string group, a six musician group. And really that, I set that session up mostly because I, I was kind of treating it more, almost more like a source session. So I wanted to create a lot of raw material that I could work with to create the whole score. That was really the purpose of that session. I did record some material, you know, I notated it, but <laughs> I kind of just walked into that session with a lot of written notes and not really a lot of notation for musicians to read. And then I just gave a lot of direction. So I, I was really... I knew what I wanted, but at the same time, I kind of wanted to. I wanted to leave it open because I wanted to see, you know, when, when you deal with really talented instrumentalists, you know, they can always come up with ideas and bring things to the table that that I'm not going to think of. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to leave it a little open for that, so I could maybe capture some magic that I wasn't thinking about. So that you did that part first. Yes, yes, I did. I mean, how did that affect you to do that first rather than the full orchestra, more melodic stuff? Do you think that had any effect on you at all? I actually thought it doing it that way came out really well because my writing process, I think of myself as much as a, a producer or uh, even a sound designer as much as I would as a composer. So I'm thinking in terms of like the sonic palette and almost like sculpting as opposed to 
composing. So in recording that session at Berkeley, it gave me basically this arsenal of material to work with where I could start to build the compositions. And, and then once I built that that up with, you know, I built these compositions, I was kind of in a place where it put me in a good position when I when I went into the the big session, basically. Yeah, because then you'd already created that sound world, that bed, you had that, uh, you had the frame, and then you just needed to put all the stuff in there, right? Yeah, exactly. And, mm-hmm. you know, like a lot of composers I'm doing, you know, I already have my sample libraries, I'm, and I'm doing a lot of mock-up stuff anyway, that's, these days, sounds pretty good with the quality of the libraries out there. So by the time, you know, combining that material, and then with the mock-ups before I go into the session, you know, I, I have a really great idea of what it's going to sound like um, even before I, I go into the, the big session record. So one other note, too, that was interesting was the big session was kind of, it was scheduled so, like a lot of music for games where sometimes you're not recording until the last minute and you record your live stuff and then you do a quick mix and then you get into the game and and that's it. I thought that was going to initially happen, but then as I was working on the soundtrack, they gave about, I think it was about two more months for development. So what was really great was... I was able to record that material in Nashville, and then I was able to use that material and repurpose it a lot for a lot of new compositions. So it's pretty interesting to be able to to have that material itself a source where I could create compositions based off that material too. So I got a lot of mileage out of everything. You say that you wanted to not write the themes right away, uh, mm-hmm. in the article. And I'm interested in that. I think that's uh, kind of cool, too, that you, again, it's kind of the same concept of doing it with the orchestra, where you you build a, an atmosphere first, right? And then you kind of mm-hmm. play, play with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like to get to know the project really well um, that I'm working on before I dive in and start to create thematic ideas. And in doing that, you know, as I'm getting to know the story better and the gameplay better and the people working on the project better and their process and, and what's going on, I don't like to focus on themes up front because I, I sometimes feel that if I don't know what the project's about and then I create these ideas that, you know, by the time I get to the middle of it, maybe these themes or motifs aren't really going to be appropriate. And so for me, it's, you know, I'm warming up to the project. I'm really getting to know it. So by the time these ideas start to appear for me, I'm really comfortable with what I know about the project and I'm comfortable with the project. So that works really well for me. And for me, for my process, it's really been instrumental in in creating appropriate themes that, that nail the emotion. about some of the themes sure so i didn't really have a a theme for the main character i think what i focused on more was i have this general theme that is really for the game itself and so it it appears in various places maybe that's almost tied to the main character himself or kind of his sadness or the the emotion or his emotion or how he feels Mm -hmm. so i think there's that um, I, I did some interesting things with one theme. There's a giant creature. Kind of a, it's a boss in the middle of the game, and I have a friend his named Sergey Fomin, and he lives in Belarus. And he's a he used to be audio director at War Gaming. He was uh, worked on World of Tanks, and so we've known each other for a little while, and we're pretty good friends. And he does a lot of field recording, and so he was out. And he recorded these Alp horns. Uh, somewhere in Belarus, and 
he's always sharing his libraries with me and he, he's a really great recordist. So one time he shared these Alphorns with me. I'm like, wow, these were really, really, really amazing because I'm always looking for sounds like that. And so I thought, I'm going to find somewhere to use, use these. And I think I just started working on the project when he played that stuff for me. And I'm like, and, and not long after I thought, Oh, here's like the perfect place to use these because they're really, they're really so primal in sound. And, and so what I did was I just took those and I did some manipulation and pitched them down so they were really slow and and monstrous sounding and (laughs) put a lot of reverb on them. And that basically became the core, kind of the core motif for, for that creature. And tell me more about the main theme for the game, then. I'm always looking for something when I create themes. I'm always looking f- to create it in as simplest form as possible. So it's it's kind of this really simple, you know, I have a two-chord progression, and then I take that progression, and then I just take it down half a step. And then I put a melody on top of it that I basically, you know, anytime I'm creating a melody, I I don't really sit down to the piano and, and play it. I will come up with chords like that and then I'll try to sing something on top of it because I'm always looking for something that's really, you know, that's basically singable because I think otherwise it has the potential to become a little complicated. Why was this, or is this, or has this been your dream project? I really love games that have a strong narrative element, and this definitely had that. I always like working on games that have a bit of a darker strain to them. Mm -hmm. And so this was a perfect fit for me from that perspective, because it allowed me to explore a lot of more mysterious, darker elements. Less Ratchet and Clank and more... Yeah, definitely less Ratchet and Clank. So, (laughs) you know, Ratchet and Clank being kind of... It has this epic feeling. And, I mean, there are definitely emotional elements for that that can be a little more serious. But I think this game, it's unbridled in terms of it's not hiding it in any way. And not to say that Ratchet always hides it, but I think that there's kind of the happy, heroic element to Ratchet that we don't really have in Edge of Nowhere. Well, let's talk about Ratchet and Clank for a few minutes, and we'll come back to Edge of Nowhere because there's more to talk about. But tell me a little bit about working on Ratchet and Clank for PS4. Sure. So that was my fourth title that I worked on with Insomniac. It was the fourth Ratchet title. And, you know, I've known Jamie McMenemy, who's the audio lead there, for a long time, probably maybe about 15 years, six, maybe longer than that now. (laughs) And he worked with me when we were at Oddworld, and then I did a little work with him before that even. So um, so we kind of have a long history together. And and then he helped get me on board for the, the Ratchet series back in 2000, I think it's 2010. And so we've had a chance to work on these, you know, work on the series together. And then also with the, the rest of the team. And Insomniac, you know, we, we've kind of developed this process over time as far as how we work and and especially you know when you work on the same series we've got a a pretty good process which allows me to think more about the creative elements as opposed to always having to address technical issues and other things like that that might come up on other games so that's really great the the ps4 game this last title 
There was a lot of music in this game. It was yes. About, I think it was four hours of music. It was it was a monstrous it's amount huge, of music. It's huge, yeah. I think the first game I worked on for them was Ratchet and Clank All for One. And that had a ton of music, too. It was four hours of music. And then the games in between, they had a smaller amount, like an hour and a half or something. But this last game was really monstrous, and it had about four hours. We kind of did the same thing as I did with Edge of Nowhere. I went to uh, Nashville to record, and I think we we recorded for two days. And uh, it was really great. This project was big enough where... I actually brought a couple of other composers on board with me, and they worked with me on some of this stuff. So, because it's, it was such a huge game, I wasn't going to be able to create all the music yeah. myself. You know, in games that are this big, that's really common. And so, you know, that's when your people skills kick in, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You become a producer. So, yeah. Um, in, in addition to a composer or lead composer, you know, you become a, I become a producer too. So, sure. I mean, I've done a fair amount of work also as an audio director. So I'm, I'm used to that. And, uh, but it's definitely, there's definitely a, a people skills element when working on a project of that size and I'm working with a team that's that's bigger than just me. Yeah, and Insomniac Games, I mean, they did Ratchet, they did Edge of Nowhere, they, they've done, you know, many other titles, all of which have great music, and it seems like that mm. company really cares about how their games sound musically, too. They do. They really care because they know that it's really an important element of what the game is and what it's about. And, you know, they have an internal audio team. Uh, they have two audio teams. They have one, they have two studios. They have a Burbank studio and then they have North Carolina studio. And I think the Burbank team, I don't know how many people are there now, but maybe, I think between the two, I would guess they might have about a dozen audio people on staff now. Mm. I'm not sure, but they're all really awesome and they really care about the work they do. So it must be really fun to work on that series because it's so fun to play. Yeah, it is a, a fun series to work on. I obviously have done a lot of orchestral work, but I do a lot of electronic work too. And and so this is really a great game to be able to combine the two elements and, mm -hmm. and sometimes do it in interesting ways. And and you know, even though it's it's a series and, and we have some elements we stick to, maybe in terms of uh, some character themes, and there's kind of a general vibe that we're trying to stay within. I always feel that every time I've worked on a Ratchet title, I'm, I'm doing something different. Speaking of electronic music, you also wrote some really great music for Counter-Strike Go or Counter-Strike oh, yeah, Global yeah. Offensive. So they have these composer packs, right? Or music packs yes. that you can download. And I love how they've done that. So talk a little bit about that and then, you know, getting to work on that game. Yeah, sure. That was a lot of fun to do because it, I mean, I love working on huge games. You know, we have two, three, four hours of music, but the music for Counter Strike, there's a lot less music. Right. I think it came out to be only about seven minutes of music. I can't remember now, but so Valve will work directly with some composers to create these packs. But the cool thing is they just kind of say, do whatever you want to do, you know, create whatever you want to create. Because really, what they're looking to do is they want to create some variety in the pack. So there are, there are other composers working on the same thing. And we're all basically writing the same cues, but we're taking our own approach to it. We're, and nobody's hearing what anybody else is doing. And each pack, each composer's pack is, is a self-contained pack. So it's not like you're mixing the packs together. That project was a lot of fun because I got to, I didn't really have a time limit. They just said, whenever you, whenever you get it done, you get it done. Valve. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So let's go back to, well, no, we should talk about Oddworld. Holy cow, this is a whole other giant, oh, yeah. like, culty, people love these games. So, yeah. and you've been the composer from the start of Oddworld, right? Not from the start. Um, okay. Josh Gabriel and Ella Myers, they were the very first composers on it together. And and then um, I came in I came in at Munch's Odyssey, and I worked on Munch's Odyssey, Stranger's Wrath, and also New and Tasty, which was kind of a remake of Abe's Odyssey, but they did a lot of different things with it. So they added uh, new gameplay elements. And, and while we did use some of the old music, I, I got the chance to write some new material too. Stranger's yeah. Wrath. For, for that one, the, you know, the music in that is also fabulous. And it's real guitar heavy. And mm-hmm, you learned is. to do that. <laughs> for that game. This is fascinating. Tell that story. Yeah, so it's interesting with Oddworld. I mean, we were working, you know, those are AAA games, but at the same time, we were a small independent studio, and, and resources are always limited when you work at an indie studio. So you, you have to kind of find creative ways to get around things or creative ways to do things, which which create interesting approaches or interesting sounds at least you know from the music perspective and and then there's the process itself and working with uh, Lauren Landing as the creative director you know Lauren liked to have he likes to have everything he likes to be able to iterate and have everything up in the air and be able to change things and so that kind of goes against things when it comes to just say I want to go out and I want to record a guitarist or I want to record an orchestra basically once you record that stuff you have some flexibility, but what you get is what you get, right? Yeah. And so he he was always worried that if we recorded, we wouldn't be able to, you know, if he wanted to go a totally different direction, then we'd have to throw that away. And so there's that cost involved, and, and then there's kind of the lack of flexibility and iteration. So what he always pushed for was, like, if you can figure out how to do it yourself, that's really great. So I wanted to hire a guitarist, but he was pretty hesitant. And so I came up with the idea that I said, here's the deal. Okay, so we can't hire a guitarist, but why don't you buy a guitar for me? I'll figure out how to play it. Um, Because, you know, this is a a longer timeline. It was a three-year project where we worked on it. So I had a little time. And then the same thing with percussion, too, where I made a deal. I said, if you pay for my percussion lessons, then I'll play the percussion myself. And so that's, I basically learned, I I became very, very self-sufficient when I worked at that studio. I actually worked in-house there at the time. And so I became very self-sufficient in being able to do and being able to create music. And and I think because of that, there was a different result that came out of it because of that process. Because of that process, I was kind of pushed or maybe forced into, but but I think it was really good. I, I, I don't have any regrets, and, and I think, if anything, I learned so much. Curious about uh, the VR aspect and how that impacted your composition, and also, I mean, that it came out last year, but you would have been working on it way before that, so technology even now is different, I would think. So, mm-hmm. so talk to me a little bit about that part and how that fits in with your writing. It wasn't even that long ago, right? It was only released a year ago, but so much I've learned so much about VR in that time. I've, you know, I've worked on some additional VR projects and but that was the first VR project I'd worked on and it was the first VR project that Insomniac had worked on and it was before, you know, the Rift launched and so everybody was in the same boat, not just Insomniac and me, but pretty much the whole industry exactly. working on. And so Nobody knew what was going on, and we're all trying to figure it out. And and people, you know, who are designing for console games or PC games or mobile games, you, you couldn't take those same approaches and apply them to VR because people are still trying to figure that out. Like, how do you design for VR? How do you make a really great game in VR? And there are some good experiences out there, some great experiences, but I, I think that we're still in the early stages of that field and I think we're going to see some really incredible things come out of it but back then we're trying to figure out like what you know how can we approach this medium and generally I think there's some things I did that 
you know, from maybe more of a technical span standpoint, not necessarily creative standpoint, but more of a technical standpoint that I, I think I would have done differently. You know, like today I would do things differently than I did back then mm. because my head wasn't totally in the space yet in the VR space. There were some things I wasn't thinking about or I kind of had, I was thinking more from like a kind of a PC or console game mentality. Um, Can you but, give me an example? Yeah, I think with mixing as an example, mixing is a great example. With music and console games or PC games, we were either mixing in stereo or we mix a 5.1, but we're really mixing the material so it sits in the front, right? So mm -hmm. so music's kind of like, even in a 5.1 mix, really the emphasis is on the front of the mix as opposed to the back. Whereas I think with VR, because you're, you know, once you put that headset on, you're in the space, you are in the space, like your body might be here in your bedroom, but your, your head is, is somewhere else, like it's on Mars, or it's, it's in Antarctica or whatever, right? Yeah. So I think there are a lot of opportunities to, to really do something innovative or different with, with music mixing, where maybe you could create, I, I could have created mixes that surrounded the player and were much more immersive. Or maybe I could have written the music in such a way where if the action was to the left and to the back, maybe I would have mixed the music so there was a little more emphasis on that location. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having the music so it's, it, it's just kind of locked with the head and moves with the head. been really neat to to just dig into your music more and get to certainly get to know you better and talk with you and it's been a pleasure yeah it's been great talking to you too Thanks for listening to episode 71 of Level with Emily Reese. You can learn more about Michael Bross at bross.com and on patreon.com slash level. You'll find a playlist on our Patreon page as well. I'm Emily Reese. Sam Keenan is our producer. Say hi, Sam. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Level with Emily. Level with Emily Reese is a production of June Media, Inc. Learn more at june-media.com and June is J-O-O-N.